This video is about different ways to model profit maximization, and I think it's helpful before you launch into all these different models from ground up to have an overall framework for how do you think about this and how flexible are profit maximization models. Because these are all really essentially one model, it's just that one model you can use different choice variables, you can define revenue differently, you can, you can make part of it linear and part of it curvy. There's lots of different ways of modeling profit maximization and if you know sort of how to use the different flexible parts and really building a profit maximization model is like a mix and match putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So if you understand it that way, it's just gonna be a lot easier to approach the whole field of microeconomic theory. So let's start off by just defining profit. So profit is just revenue minus costs. And if you're gonna build a model, you need some choice variable, which is just what is the thing that the firm is choosing right now? And we could come up with a list of brainstormy types of choice variables that we might want to build into a model. So let's do that. All right, so here's some classic choice variables that you'll see all over the place in microeconomic theory. The firm could choose price, the firm could choose quantity to produce, the firm could choose how many workers to employ, the firm could choose how many machines to buy or some version of capital, and of course the list could go on and on. Basically any decision that a manager of a firm makes could be modeled and of course whatever decision they're making, that's gonna be the choice variable. But a lot of the classic models use really one of these four um, types of choice variables, price, quantity, or some type of input, which might be labor, might be capital, or might be some other type of input. And then I added advertising on here just to remind you that there's lots of decisions firms make. A lot of them are strategic decisions, and therefore we could gain from modeling those. So other models are going to add in different types of choice variables and that's totally fine. Now, if you're ever asked to build a profit maximization model from scratch, the very simplest way to do that would just be to have revenue as a function of whatever your choice variable is, minus costs as a function of whatever your choice variable is. And that's always going to be a viable model. So let me just put that up here. So I've just done three of them, so you could maximize by choosing the quantity to produce. Revenue as a function of the quantity you produce minus costs as a function of quantity you produce. And same down here, if you choose price, you've got revenue as a function of price minus costs as a function of price. Now this one feels a little bit weird, so um, it's not wrong, but it might be helpful for us to sort of specify this a little bit further which we'll do in a second, but, but just to show you that the pattern is generalizable, here we've got maximized by choosing our inputs, such as labor and capital, revenue as a function of our inputs, labor and capital minus costs as a function of our inputs. All of these are completely viable models. The very simplest model you can come up with is always just sticking your choice variable inside the revenue minus cost function. Now, you might want to actually specify some of these further. Um, and in particular, I've pointed out the fact that costs as a function of price feels a little bit weird. So at that point, you start to brainstorm, why are costs a function of price? And you might come up with the idea that, oh, wait a second, the price is going to determine how many we sell and the number of products we have to make, that is how many we sell, is going to determine costs. So this gets at the idea that costs are a function of quantity, which is a function of price. Okay, I've just done that. Costs are a function of quantity that we produce, because we know that for every unit we produce, it's gonna cost some money. And quantity might be a function of price. As a matter of fact, there is a special relationship between price and quantity. And in fact, this function has a name. That's a demand function. And I will define a demand function as any relationship between price and quantity demanded. And of course, the law of demand is the fact that there's a negative relationship between those two things. And you could flip this around. You could have price as a function of quantity or quantity as a function of price. Now, some textbooks will say one of those is a demand function, the other is an inverse demand function. I don't really care to make that distinction. Just use whichever one actually works in your model 
and the one that works in this model is the one with price on the inside of the function and quantity on the outside. All right, so it's possible that we want to change up the way some of these look so that we're specifying revenue a little bit more carefully. And to do that, we might want to acknowledge that revenue is price times quantity. In which case, let's start with this top one and think about the different variations where quantity is the choice variable. How could we specify what exactly the revenue function is and what exactly the cost function is? Okay, so I've set up a model, and this model is actually not going to work, but we're going to figure that out in a second. Why doesn't this work? And we're going to adjust it to make it work. So here we've got um, price times quantity, that's revenue, and we've got marginal cost times quantity. And anytime you see marginal cost as an exogenous function in a model, you're just thinking, okay, it costs $10 to produce a t-shirt, so the total spending, the total cost to the company is $10 times the quantity we produce. And that, of course, is a linear function. And many models will have this formulation. It's not going to work in this particular model for reasons I'm going to specify very soon. Now, price, the way I've set it up, is going to be an exogenous variable. And we might think, when is price exogenous? In perfectly competitive markets, price is essentially exogenous. That is, firms are price takers they have to look at how much is this selling for in the market, and we don't really have control over that. We kind of have to go with the market price. And I represent exogenous with a bar over the, the variable. Okay, so what is the problem with this objective function? And the problem is going to be that both terms are linear, and you can't have a model where both terms are linear. Models don't work unless there's at least curvature in one or the other. So first, let's look and see why that is. Okay, so I've drawn the revenue and cost functions where they're both linear, and there's basically two ways this could be. One is revenue has a flatter slope, costs have a steeper slope. The other is revenue has a steeper slope and costs have a flatter slope. And in both of these two cases, the solution to the model is trivial. So up here, how do you maximize revenue minus cost? You maximize it at quantity equals zero, so Q star. And I always represent Q star as the optimal quantity, the solution to the model. So that's, that's a trivial model. And down here, the optimal quantity to produce is infinite because we see that revenue minus cost just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So because of this, we know that models where both the benefit and cost are linear are not going to work. And we can fix them in one of two ways. Either we can give curvature to the cost function or give curvature to the benefit function. So let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so I've set up the revenue function here with curvature, diminishing marginal benefit, the classic shape we see in economics. And when you have this, there is going to be a meaningful non-zero, non-infinity value for the optimal quantity. And that optimal quantity happens where the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost, the golden rule of economics. And down here, same thing. Now, it's also perfectly fine if both of these have curvature, but you need at least one of the two, either revenue or cost, to have curvature if you want a model that makes sense. So let's go back to our other model and try to fix it. Okay, to remind you, we started with a generic revenue minus cost function. That's perfectly correct. Um, and then we, we made both terms linear, and we just went over to see why can we not do that. So now we need to make one or the other term uh, nonlinear. And for simplicity, I'm going to make this one nonlinear, where this cost function is just going to be an increasing marginal cost function. All right, so now we have a viable model, slightly different or slightly more specified than the model up here. Now, we notice that this model is perfectly competitive. It, we have price as exogenous. But how would we handle this if we did not think price was exogenous? What if we thought that the market price would be determined based on how many we put out in the market? So what if the quantity we produce is going to determine the market price? And of course, that sounds like a monopoly model. It is a monopoly model. And so let's figure out how to set that up. Okay, and as a matter of fact, there's going to be some curvature over here, given that we've got this function, so I'm actually going to simplify the costs over here. 
Okay, and you notice that we still have price times quantity, it's just here price is exogenous because it's a perfectly competitive environment, and here quantity determines price, that's the relationship between those is a demand function because we have a monopoly model where um, there is some market power, you can put out however many you want and that's going to determine the market price. Perfect competition has an exogenous price, Monopoly price is determined by quantity through the demand function. Okay, so those are three variations on the profit maximization model, but what if we wanted to choose a different choice variable? For example, what if we wanted to choose price as a choice variable? Let's start up with our simplest version and see if we can build on that. Okay, this is what we had before. Price is our choice variable, revenue depends on price, and costs depend on quantity, which depends on price, where this is a demand function. Now the question is, can we use our little formula for revenue, price times quantity, to plug it in for this? And let's see if that works. Okay, now when students get here, oftentimes they have an impulse to add quantity as a choice variable. But you're not allowed to do that, and why are you not allowed to do that? Well. Firms cannot choose both price and quantity because if they can, they're gonna choose a price of infinity and a quantity of infinity. And we know that's not realistic, and so that reminds us that actually, you can only choose price or quantity. You can't choose both because the demand curve represents people's relationship between price and quantity in terms of their willingness to buy. So if you want price as a choice variable, that means that quantity is going to be a function of price. All right, and that works, that works. We've got price times quantity, that's revenue, minus costs, which are a function of quantity, which is a function of price. So we've now set up a profit maximization function where price is our choice variable, and is it perfect competition or is this a monopoly model? Well, this cannot be perfect competition because price is not exogenous. Okay, so we know this could be a monopoly model, and probably is, or it could be monopolistic competition, and that really depends on the shape of the demand curve. If the demand curve is fairly elastic because there's a bunch of imperfect substitutes out there, then this is a monopolistic competition model. If there are almost no good substitutes out there, then the demand curve is gonna be fairly inelastic, in which case this is gonna be more of a monopoly model. And of course, that's really a spectrum. So now that we've done two different choice variables in a little bit more detail, let's do inputs as the choice variable. All right, we started out with the simplest form, just revenue as a function of our inputs, minus costs as a function of our inputs, but let's try to specify both of these a little bit more carefully. So if we wanna do revenue, let's break it down as we have been into price times quantity. And in doing that, I had to decide price or quantity, which of those things is influenced most directly by these inputs, the workers and the machines, well, it's quantity. So I've set up price times quantity, and to keep things simple, I'm going to let price be exogenous, in other words, a perfectly competitive market. So we've got our revenue function, and as a matter of fact, this function has a name for it. This is the production function. And of course, if you use Halvarian's microeconomic theory textbook like I do, you know that the production function has a few different ways that they refer to it in the textbook. One is they call quantity Y, which is output, output of the firm. And output is literally just quantity. And the other is sometimes they'll just let it be F, like function, production function. So I just wanna notate both of those are the same thing. Let's put it up here. Now, what about costs? Is there any linear way of doing costs? Because, of course, we know our production function can definitely have curvature to it, right? Um, as a matter of fact, we could draw a little production function. So here I have output or quantity, same thing, um, versus x1 versus labor or people hired, and we know that our production function has diminishing marginal product, that's a property we see all over the place, so we've got curvature in here, meaning it would be possible to make this linear. And one thing about curvature versus linear, the part of the problem that you wanna spend more time thinking more carefully about is generally going to be the part with curvature. So if we really wanted to think a lot about production and not so much about the costs, we probably wanna make the costs linear. And in this one, the way to do that is to simply have an input price, wages for the workers and the price of machine for the capital. And Varian's book uses W for this, which is nice since wages is one of the input prices. All right, so now we have one of these profit maximization models. 
And I guess one last thing I want to say about this is right now we have two inputs, capital and labor. If we wanted to hold capital fixed, um, sort of making that exogenous. Now we know uh, the input prices are exogenous. Here the price is exogenous. If we wanted to make capital fixed, that just means it's a short run model. If we let capital vary, then it's a long run model. Oh, and if we make capital fixed, then it's no longer a choice variable. We have to get rid of that. So that is our short run model and making capital a choice variable means that's a long run model. Very simple. So I think that's all I'm gonna say about this for now, but I hope this has given you a framework for thinking about how flexible profit maximization models are, how you're really thinking about what are the choice variables that you wanna focus on for your model, where do you wanna add curvature, make sure there's curvature somewhere, what is exogenous, and your assumptions about what's exogenous has these real world implications. So I, I hope you found this helpful, it's been fun for me.